as you see, my name is Paula J. Nice job, by the way, on pronouncing my last name. Uh, and uh, I'm from Poland. Uh, indeed, I'm the CEO of Secure. It's a company that performs the, as we call it, high quality cybersecurity services. Uh, we do a lot of R&D. And uh, me as a person uh, being right now 14 years in the cybersecurity field, I've got access to the source code of Windows. That's something that technically Microsoft gave me uh, because apparently they trust me. I don't know. <laughs> That's their decision. I'm just kidding, of course. Uh, I have access to like 99%. We still do a lot of R&D in the Microsoft code and um, we don't have access to this 100%, and that's the most juicy part. So, uh, yeah, let me share with you a couple of things. Uh, let's just jump immediately to the field, uh, since we've got only 45 minutes, and forensic is a subject that could last for the month. So, uh, just a couple of words. Here is my Twitter. Our blog, secureacademy.com, is the one after which, five minutes before the presentation, my team is publishing the slides and tools that you're going to see during this presentation. So after you finish and leave the room, check it out, it's there. Yeah, it's hot and fresh. And also, um, welcome back if you've seen my presentations already. I've been speaking at the RSA last year as well. And basically, um, I also have a pleasure to speak at Ignite um, and, uh, well, Black Hat and all the cybersecurity conferences, uh, mainly because of our data protection API research. Uh, which is technically the, related with decrypting user secrets. So that's the that's my background. My background is purely cybersecurity, with uh, a little bit of a background of uh, scripting as well, but mainly infrastructure security. And what I would like to talk about today, it's anything interesting that you can find out in the infrastructure after the situation, after the attack, maybe, uh, so that it's not obvious, but it's definitely worth to look at. Yes, yeah, so we will not be talking about, oh, in order to like, do the forensics, check, the, check out the user profiles. Well, yeah, it's one of the most important steps too, but eventually uh, let's talk about these cool things since we've got only 45 minutes. Before we jump to the subject, um, one story uh, before we start, and that story actually is related with one of our customers, and uh, it's literally that one of our customers called me and they were like, okay, Paula, so we have to have you on site at our one of our factory premises pretty much immediately. That's the first thing. Second, uh, we have a, like a problem because whole infrastructure went down. We cannot authenticate anywhere. They're like a little panicking, I can tell you. And uh, it has been already for two and a half days. We've lost, uh, well, this was in Europe, so we lost approximately four million euros, which is four and a half million dollars. I mean, you could buy a nice Lambo for that. But anyway, so this is, this is the situation. So I'm like, okay, team, rescheduling, we fly on board. What happens is that this customer says that basically uh, they've been probably uh, become a victim of the sabotage, internal sabotage attack. And uh, that's becoming a little scary because you don't really know who you're dealing with when you get inside. Who is the person that is responsible for putting the infrastructure down? And it appeared all the domain controllers were down. So uh, that they had a pretty hectic situation. We come on board and there is this nice guy with a banana smile that says like, hey, welcome. Yeah, this is the domain admin. Such a nice guy. A little handsome too, don't get me wrong. I do have a husband and I'm not kidding. Uh, it's just like, you know, uh, this, uh, I would say, mm, privileges of being a woman in the IT world. <laughs> but eventually, um, this guy, absolutely nice guy, being absolutely helpful, appeared to be the one that was actually killing this infrastructure. Yeah? So he had this fireman syndrome. So let's kill a couple of servers and let's appear all in white and then let's fix everything and obviously he's the one that is amazing. Yeah? Plus, one more thing, he was actually getting paid for it as it appeared later within the forensics. But what's the problem? So you know already the end of the story. But when we get inside, you don't really know where to start from. Because the first question that we asked to the guys was, Okay, could you please provide us an evidence? So the memory dump, disk dump of the domain controllers that were affected. And they were like, duh. So obviously they don't have it because they didn't execute the incident response procedure. How come? It's a big factory losing lots of money, but they don't have it. So we are like, oh great. So let's jump into all of the infrastructure now, literally searching for the needle in a haystack. And we don't know what we are looking for, but maybe some anomaly, maybe something cool, I mean, I don't know. So what we found out, and that's actually quite interesting, is that on this domain this admin's computer, in the event log, the evidence was no evidence because there were gaps in the event log 
while he was actually rebooting from the live USB drive and he was actually attacking systems from that. So we were like, aha, uh -huh, is this a coincidence when these servers are down in correlation of what we don't see? And obviously it is. So this actually triggered us to dig in and this was one of our favorite projects. And in general, the conclusion is very simple. There is always something you can find, always. It's just enough, you need to have enough time, you need to have enough, you need to be stubborn enough to find all these details. So let's dig in into very interesting areas, how and where we are able to find information in the operating system. Now a little bit of theory, if you don't mind, so that the first thing we're gonna focus on is a disk. Even though we should first, of course, perform the memory dump as a matter of evidence collection, this session is more educational. We don't put it in an order, we put it more knowledge-based. Yes, so when we are analyzing a disk, what kind of things we should do? First of all, obviously we should image it so that we have a copy of the evidence, this is obvious. Now, second thing that we should do, we should start extracting all this interesting information that is out there that is, uh, in most cases, by most of the tools that are available in the market, extractable automatically. So things like I mentioned at the very beginning, users' profiles, things about what has been in most recently used, blah, blah, blah. But what if hacker is smarter than this tool? That's the problem, yes? So who is always smarter? You, hacker, you, hacker, tool, hacker, etc. So it's always this a little bit, little bit of a battle. And what is super cool is to find out all these little thingies that could indicate that attack was actually happening, but all these different types of tools, that in most cases, they don't search for it. And this is what this session is about. All these places that they don't really come out in the automated tools. So what I would like to show you first, and let's start from the nice, nice um, area within the operating system, that is related with the indexing service of Windows. So Windows, we all know, uh, it has the indexing capabilities, so every single time you put the file on the drive, the indexing service gets it, that's actually triggered by the journal, and then eventually puts it in its own database. It's an EDB database, performance of it, it's okay, but nothing to complain, but eventually, what is beautiful part is that once you put stuff on the disk that goes to the indexing database, if you delete it, it's still there, because this is why, and this is what everybody is complaining about, that indexing file grows. And after a couple of months of using Windows, your indexing file is like a couple of gigs, good couple of gigs. If you are wondering why, is this, that's exactly why. So this is a very good source of information of a facts. So you could be like, was there any file that I don't want on my disk? Yes, okay, let's find out. It's gonna be probably in the indexing service database. So what I would like to show you is a couple of things. First of all, before you think about getting access to the indexing service, uh, you need to, well, know where it is and indexing, of course, database. So this one uh, you're gonna find on the, on the disk and you're gonna find it within the uh, program data. So we, let's get there actually. So we've got our program data and it is in, um, well, uh, in, this, in Microsoft, here we go. And then we're gonna get into a search and we're gonna get to data and then we're gonna get to applications and then we get to Windows. And if we do this, yes, then basically this Windows EDB, it's the indexing service database. That indexing service database cannot be copied just like that because of a non-share handle to that file, which means that you have to create a shadow copy in order to copy that file. Yeah, so hopefully this is clear. Now, in Windows 10, so Windows client, let me put it in a generic words, you don't have a possibility to use VSS admin as you could do in a server. VSS admin, create shadow, and that's it. You have to figure out the other ways. Either you take the VSS admin from the server to create the shadow copy, or just for your information, what we could do, uh, we could create a shadow copy like this, so this is basically in PowerShell. That script will be available for you on my blog, so you can take a picture or you can just enjoy. Uh, and uh, technically, that's gonna be created as a C shadow copy, so I'm creating the symbolic link. Uh, so this is mclink build in Windows tool to the shadow copy to the C drive, yes? So I can technically run that part. Now, what is interesting is that from the shadow copy, so C shadow copy, I'll be able to copy the Windows EDB. So right now I have that part, so I can get out and Shadow copy, of course, this is technically everything that I have on my drive. Uh, I will not copy the file right now because it takes time. It's just a couple of gigabytes. So I have copied it already before the presentation. And what I would like to show you is how you are able to, well, first of all, open it up. Second thing, what is actually inside? So what I've got, 
Um, I'm going to open this Windows EDB file, which I copied to myself to see analysis Windows EDB as you see on the top path of the tool. The tool is called ESC Database View. It's a free tool, uh, which is a very simple tool to view the ESC DB format. And it's not the best format, as I already mentioned, but it allows you the possibility to review it as it was a database. So if we do go to the uh, G JTHR, so this is an area which will show us the uh, content of the index, it takes a moment, if I enlarge it, what you will see over here is, um, well, we can just search through it uh, because it's a lot of different types of uh, files, but let's say I had a file which was called bireport.png and technically all of these files that are out there you are able to find. Yes, what is best? You can do Mimikatz, for example, and of course this is all searchable, yes, so eventually Yes, you are able to see that there is actually Mimikaz.exe somewhere or it was somewhere on the disk. And this is technically, historically, what you were able to see, what was ever on the disk. Yeah? So any tools hacker dropped, that's going to be the place to search for. Yeah? So not a very obvious place to search, uh, but um, worth knowing. Yeah? So this is the first area that I wanted to show you. Now, what else is interesting that is worth having a look at? So we've got the Windows indexing service. That's one. Second one, it's going to be related with that prefetch. Now, prefetch is, uh, it has been already available within Windows XP. Not everybody was maybe using it, but the prefetch has a very cool functionality. It was designed for the drives that were not SSD. So putting this in the short story, uh, if you are planning to launch something big, if you had this gramophone disk, then basically it took a long time to load all these different libraries to the memory. So within the SSD is not a problem, but the prefetch, what it did, it collected the history of anything that you are doing and then if you were launching, for example, Photoshop at 8 a.m., then before you even thought about it, it actually loaded a bunch of files to the memory already so that it's enough that you click and then everything is in the memory already. Yeah? So prefetch is still there. It's in most systems, I guess, for you, it's going to be disabled. You can enable it in a registry. We always recommend enabling it. It actually saved once our customer from specifying where the ransomware came from by the prefetch. And this is why, and that's why, I would like to recommend using prefetch just like that as a side solution to support you in a case of forensics when something bad happens. Yeah? So let me show you how prefetch works and what it actually gives you. So prefetch itself, let's go to Windows prefetch. And if we do for the prefetch files, contains the PF files. Yeah? So these PF files um, and this date over here indicates what was the last time I was actually editing it, opening it, etc. Yeah? So if I, for example, launched, let's say, um, Zoom it, yes, this was basically today. Uh, that's why I'm enlarging uh, your images. So this is technically, as we can see, this is at 11 p.m. This is my time in, in my country. And eventually you are able to spot that this was the last time some person ran it. So how, do we can, how can we use it basically for the forensic? Here is the thing. So what our team did, we wrote the tool. And by the way, uh, just to give you the concept, uh, we, I'm not advertising it. It's just useful. We share tools for free, so you can use them as you want. Uh, our, tool, our team wrote over 200 hacking tools or forensic tools as well. So you can pretty much download most of them on the blog, uh, within the blog post. This is one of the tools that is really nice because in Windows 10, uh, um, the prefetch structure changed. So if you're going to use some tools from the Windows 8, 8.1, etc., 7 for the prefetch, that will not work because Windows 10 implemented compression over prefetch structure. So that's why the tool is actually quite nice. Yeah? So most of the old tools will just fail. So how does the tool work? So CQ prefetch parser, that's the name of the tool. It's written by our developer, Michael, and it allows us to specify in this particular case, well, we're going to just use or we could use slash f or minus f file. And I have already prepared uh, the prefetch notepad file just to show you how files look inside. And I'm going to do minus a for analysis so that I'm able to uh, pretty much analyze of what's going on. Just for the enlargement, you can see the structure of the command. Yeah? Now, what it will show me is something that is not really user dependent, but system dependent. So let's have a look. So if I do minus a for the analysis, that nice output shows me, and let me go a little bit to the top, here we go, all the possible runs that I had for that version of Notepad. Yeah, so whatever that was, if you don't know the executable, then you can see like, oh, it was running only once. 
Yeah, if, if it's something commonly used, then you probably run a couple of times. So this is how we spotted on one of the machines at the customer side where the ransomware came from, because then you were like analyzing prefetches among the workstations and you were like, okay, what's this? It has been running only once and it has been running yesterday. So let's find out. And that, that piece of file was actually using different types of DLLs. So you're able to see because malware could be called Notepad. So how can you differentiate if it's Notepad malware or Notepad system by the list of the DLLs that are loaded over there? For example, yeah, it doesn't collect any digital signatures, etc. It's not that area. But there are tools that are allowing you to do that. For example, Sysmon, which you can implement um, on the on the enterprise level. But this is something that is just like a little thing that forensically could help us. Yeah. So as you can see, this is one of the one of the solutions. Also, what it shows us is that if someone was opening some kind of a text file uh, in the notepad, then basically you can see what kind of path was there yes, within the last run, and that is pretty cool. So a uh, little bit of uh, unusual areas to search through. Now, here comes the best part. This is all, by the way, system-oriented. Now, within the system, within the disk, we've got also in Windows a very cool mechanism that is called automatic destinations. And again, not a very popular place, but a little uncomfortable, um, having the knowledge that anything you have ever opened since you've installed Windows, it's traced. Yeah, so any document that you opened or someone opened that they didn't want to open is basically stored here historically within your profile. Let me show you why and where. So what's the flow? The flow is that automatic destinations it's a very common mechanism in Windows for vast majority of applications. Um, and it allows us to see the history of all the different files that this particular application, I'm going to say generically, touched. The easiest example, obviously, is going to be through Notepad or Word or Excel, because if you open a document, it's going to be there historically. But browser, for example, is one of those solutions as well. Or, for example, if you had some configuration file within the FTP software, then it's going to be there too. So all these things that the executable has to deal with, that's going to be within the history of the automatic destinations generically saying. Let me show you. So where do we find that? We find it over there. So I'm going to use for the the demonstration, the free software, which is called Structured Storage Viewer. It's an absolutely ugly software that has nothing to do with um, logic, but the only thing it does is just opens uh, files and it understands its structure. But it's good for that. So let's uh, have fun with it. So what I'm going to do, uh, first of all, I'm going to open this file. I'll show you where is it in a moment. This 9B, 9C, uh, DC, etc. that identifier is actually identifier of the 64-bit notepad in operating system, in, win in Windows, for example. Yeah? But if you check out, for example, in Forensics Wiki, there is a big list of identifiers for known applications in this world that every single time apps open something, it's going to be there. Yeah? So how do we find that particular files? And do we have to enable something? No, this is default. It's already enabled for you. So you do like this, file. And then you go to the path, let's say, number three on the list. And we've got users, pull up, data, roaming, etc. Windows recent automatic destinations. It's a hidden folder, by the way. So you have to uh, type it. And then 9B and so on. This is because I'm picking this file because I know that this is responsible for Notepad. Yeah? Now, if we choose this guy, so let's do it. So technically, you just open it up like this, and then it reloads it. Then it has the structures. I'm, I'm showing you this on my real body, on my real live laptop. So I'm going to just select the structure that I know, that I can show you. Uh, and basically, what it shows me is that in a notepad, ever, historically ever, yes? so if I was running this Windows for the past two years, that's the history of whatever you open for the past two years. And you can see that there is a path in the very bottom that says, D data desktop 2016. This is a way of cleaning desktops at the end of the year, isn't it? GFI.txt. Yeah. So I opened that file. Now, what's the practicality of that? Uh, we were analyzing the very sad, by the way, case of forensic case for the I'm sorry, childhood pornography in Iceland. And uh, one of the things that was actually helping the case was what this person opened. And we found that you through the Windows Media Player automatic destinations, and there were quite indicative names of files, which still is not a proof, but it helps uh, to dive deeper of what this person was actually opening. Yeah? So quite a nice setup. And if the user is claiming, they no, I didn't open this document, yes, you did, and you can check it out over there. Yeah? So just a small uh, thing. OK, so these are the little things in Windows 
where we are able to find more information and obviously they're not that obvious ones. Now, what's more that I wanted to show you? Well, basically, uh, whenever we are thinking about all this different information that is stored within the user's profile, this is something worth having a look. And I'm gonna show you this on the example of the um, machine that I've prepared so that how and where we are able to list information within the operating system and again, in another obvious way. Now, we were talking about profiles. I, I just want to share with you one funny thing. Profile, when we create it, it creates a several instances of itself in the operating system. One of the instances is obviously on the disk, uh, but the second one is in a registry. Now, when we delete the profile, there is a little bit of a trash left. So if, let's say, hacker created a profile that he or she deleted after the attack or whatever happened, then you can still find that information in the registry. Of course, someone could be smarter and say, ah, I know it's in the registry, so I'm gonna go there and delete that. Fine, then you have to struggle more. But all these little things, I can tell you that they happen and it's, they are foundable uh, at, at the end on, on, the, on the cyber crime scene. So let me show you the difference uh, of this deletion part. So first of all, what we're gonna do, we can list the profiles from the disk. And as you see, and I'm gonna maybe enlarge it a little bit as well over here, is that we've got admin, administrator, whatever, Blee, Freddy, Fred. So these are the profiles that we got. Now, if we do list them from the registry, this will be by the user SID. Yeah, so we've got a built-in seeds and we've got these ones. So we've got 500, which clearly indicates this is an administrator, etc. Yeah, so um, first user, guest, blah, blah, blah. So we've got those. Now, the problem with that is that if we do count all of these, so we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, fantastic, and over here we can count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and three more, yeah? So three more, we could guess that they are built in, fine, but if we have a look over here, then we've got here public. So public, is it built in or not? Yeah, so there is something that is not 100% clicking, of course, because this is exactly the situation that I was mentioning. If we do list that from the registry and we try to resolve the names of what was out there, you are able to spot that there could be indeed a profile that has been saved within the registry, but during the profile deletion, it hasn't been actually deleted. And this is this history, this cherry on the dessert, that uh, we care during the forensics part. Yeah, this little, uh, things. Okay guys, so simple thing at the very end, um, whenever we have a look at the different types of areas we've got most recently used, so anything that application collects in order to help us to be um, feeling comfortable every single time we open Microsoft Word, then you've got this list of the recently opened documents. It's just an application functionality. It's also very useful, but it has a problem. It's profile dependent. So if someone deletes the profile, then basically that's it. Unless, of course, you are performing the internal investigation, then it's useful. So it's worth knowing of what exists out there. And what I want to show you is something cool that is related with the cache of the terminal services. Now, terminal services, every single time you connect using MSTST somewhere, you got the drop-down list and you, can, you have different IP addresses or names that you have connected to. And yeah, that's something that is called brew most recently used. Now, someone could say, oh, I was this bad person connecting to the server, could I delete the most recently used so that people don't see where I was actually connecting from my cache? Totally you can do it, but there is a little bit of a problem. Not many people know that the remote desktop connection actually has a cache. So if you ever, like, if you were ever like um, having the internet cafe somewhere, that's awesome by the way, uh, because it shows lots of information where people were connecting to. Let me give you the context, okay? So let's dig in. So where's the cache? The cache is somewhere here. I'm gonna open up the application, which is called, um, so this is our, let me just put this like this, CQ early cache. Now, <laughs> don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to be funny. It's really a gift from my husband. Uh, I celebrate a names day. Uh, I don't know if you do that, like a birthday and the names day. So it's a Paula's day, yeah? So when this is a Paula's day, I expect flowers and gifts. And uh, my husband is uh, also working in our company. I'm the boss of the company and he works for me, which is perfect. And, uh, and <laughs> he gave me this gift. And uh, it's a, the most ugly gift ever, but it's actually quite charming because it's functional. So uh, let's have a look. So uh, we've got users, administrator, or whatever user, update a local Microsoft terminal server client cache. Everybody has this little cache file. 
these cache files, they, ca they, they wrap themselves in a packages of 100 megabytes. So you can have many if you are really intense on remote desktop services. This one is relatively small, but it doesn't matter, open. So what we're going to do, we're going to decode it. Now, depending on the remote desktop client version, uh, that is quite cool because um, every single time you connect to the server, what happens, and RDP is a very cool protocol, you download a picture of what you see. So that picture is actually a kind of a grid. And that grid is technically having a, like bigger uh, elements or, or smaller ones. Yeah? So depending on the client, you have to evaluate what that, what's that's going to be. That looks like a crop. So basically, what we're going to do, we're going to change the size of the grid. So now it starts to be nice. And don't get me wrong, it's not like a puzzle. You cannot put it in a whole picture because if you move your window somewhere, then the picture is being downloaded. So it's like a trashy, stuck to the end of the file pictures so that you can more or less have a look at and conclude of what someone could see. So if you ever are like on a vacation connecting using remote desktop services uh, through Internet Cafe, it's a very bad idea really to connect without uh, putting the no cache switch for MSTST. Don't forget that. Yes, because if you're displaying some kind of a banking details or whatever, yes, if I would be driving the internet cafe by the seaside, I, that would be the first thing I would look at, yes, what you've seen, yeah. So here, a uh, question to you guys. Um, what did someone see? I know it's ugly, but that's what we got. Ah, yes, thank you so much. Yeah, exactly. This is Internet Information Services. This is a console of the web server in Windows, yeah? So absolutely, um, and we can see a bunch of, bunch of things over here. And we can move, by the way, within the file, yeah? So you can specify the size. This is like nine megabytes over here, so you can move and, um, and specify which part of the file you would like to see. Yeah, so here's the, here's the thing, yeah? So you are able to see that particular type of a cache. Okay, guys, so what else do we have, yeah? Some nice stuff. Uh, things like, of course, what people type in in Windows Run, yeah? So that's actually quite easy, but I just want to show you this, yeah? Uh, what was in a Microsoft Management Console, like what consoles were open, yeah? So we've got SecPol services, so some examples, yeah? Now, Prefetch, we already discussed. Uh, Prefetch, by the way, is enabled in a registry, it's just a one key in the registry, which you can enable by specifying the Prefetch parameters in a memory management, and it has to have a value three. As I mentioned, our whole team really recommends playing with it this way. Now, what are the other places that are cool? that are worth having a look at while investigating. And let me take this out and let me jump in into NTFS or USN journal. And that is actually quite nice because quite often when we are analyzing of what's going on within the operating system and there has been an attack, we are like, oh, let's verify of what are the files that have been edited within the past two weeks. Oh, this is actually quite boring, yes, because we are expecting well, kind of, we are expecting that the hacker was a little dummy so that this person didn't really change that, that values, yes? But the problem is, and let me show you, that any metadata of the file can be changed. File, forensically, on the disk, consists of three things. Data, and this is what we rely our signature on. Name, which is easy. And the third part is the standard information. And standard information is metadata. You can change it as much as you want. It doesn't affect the digital signature of the file. And it's changeable. And that's the best. I mean, Windows changes it's when you open it. So what I want to show you is this. I do have a drive, which is E drive, as you can see. Let me show you what's in it. Uh, so this is the one. And I have a folder over here called data and uh, different files. They all have one characteristic. They're all created within the 1st of Jan 2010. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to open up this guy. Yeah, and basically this is this, like some kind of a data over here. I'm going to modify it, that's fine. So let's just do it, save. And I mean, not a biggie, we can expect what happened. The date of the modified date changed. Now, what I want to show you is how to bring that back. And uh, can we technically investigate that this has been noted within the USN journal? And again, small tip at the very beginning, USN journal needs to be enabled because within the different types of servers, it really helps to investigate of what kind of data was brought by who to the drive. So please make sure that that is actually enabled and it's just literally just one command. I'm gonna put this one on the blog, how to do that. So let's find out. First of all, just one thing, what we're gonna do, we're gonna, well, browse through the drive 
And as you see, we've got 1,000 files. One is different. Yeah, I changed it. So one file is different. OK, fine. We, this is just I'm calculating the hashes. That's it. Second thing what we're going to do, we're going to group them by the last write time, which you can expect that one file will stand out. And that's basically what we are having over here. Yeah, so the last write time, this is the one. We've got 999 files created in 2010. Fantastic. So let's move forward. Now, this is the best. We're going to technically um, specify what kind of property we've got for the uh, option with the time. Yes, yeah, so we've got a creation time, last access time, last write time. By the way, this is not everything, but that's what the PowerShell allows us to modify. And what's confusing over here, it's what we see at the end of these lines. We've got a get and set. Yeah, so what's the problem for everybody to change, like all of my files, they should be in 60s. Fine. Yeah, so let's have a look if we can do that. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to take the inform information over here from the one.txt. So that's going to be our referencing file created on 1st of Jan, yes. Second, I'm going to take a last write time of it, so 1st of Jan, and I'm going to, for every single file that is in that folder, uh, I'm going to specify that if it's not that, then please change it. And technically, I'm specifying it that I should change that part. Yeah? So that all of these dates, they should be the 1st of Jan. Okay, so let's see if we can do that. Perfect. And what happened within our file over here is that obviously it has been changed. Yeah, so you can pretty much move it back in time as much as you want to. Yeah? So don't trust the metadata, trust only one thing, which is called the USN journal. And there are a couple of ways of analyzing the journal. And again, don't get me wrong, I'm not advertising it. There are two tools you could use. One, free from the operating system, which is called FSUtil, easy. Not very convenient though, not optimized for processing data. Another one, which we wanted to write one, but this one is already okay. This is from the TZ Works. It's a paid software. Um, you can do it for free, by the way. It's just that TZ Works allows you for the better analysis because it can export it to Excel, blah, 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 blah. But anyway, let's do the free one. So FSUtil, and we are doing the US and journal for the E drive. And that is something that it was quite quick because it's a very small drive. But you are able to see that we've got a basic info change because we were changing actually, yeah, over here, the metadata of the file. And this is how you are able to spot that something was happening within the files on the drive as long as US and journal is turned on. And that is something that we need to take care about. And not in every, uh, every, every server we've seen, we've analyzed, the US and journal was on. Yeah? So these are the interesting places which we've got, which are worth having a look at, and that are related with the extracting information from the, from the operating system. Now, what I want to show you is actually quite a cool thing that is related with getting access to data that has been deleted. And we could be thinking, oh, that's not a big deal. Yes, but I would like to show you a very juicy thing which is related with the MFT. And MFT uh, can contain data. And this is pretty much what we're going to be talking about, OK? So let me explain, of course, all the different types of, uh, I'll call it file level games. So if you have a small chunk of data, can you hide it somewhere? Uh, even though you format the drive? Answer is yes, you can. And that is basically the second part of the presentation. So a little bit of a context, if you don't mind. So what's happening within the operating system? So uh, eventually, what we're going to do, uh, we're going to do a little bit of a forensics on an active, um, active way. And we're going to attach the drive. And let me technically pull out the PowerShell over here. Mm -hmm. Here we go. And uh, so we've got that. And we're going to attach the drive. Uh, and we're going to do it read only. Yeah? So eventually, that particular drive it should be read only because for that particular analysis, we don't want any type of a, a modification of the drive. It's quite straightforward. So, so the story pretty much goes like this. We've got a disk from the attacked machine. And uh, basically, um, we could we could have imaged this by using the, um, for example, disk to VHD from system journals, or we could use it to image it by using the free access data software, etc. So there are plenty of ways how we could do it. This is, by the way, also used by FBI. Uh, and uh, what we're going to do? Uh, technically, uh, we're going to just make sure that everything works fine. So we're going to do dear uh, x. Uh, no, 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 do, 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 dear x. Let's do it this way. No, let me just get to X, dear. Okay, fine. Okay, so this is this is fantastic, and our job would be quite straightforward. 
because we're going to be, uh, let's just go to the C drive for the moment, we're going to be extracting the file that has been deleted, yes? Now, it's actually quite cool uh, because there is a module within the PowerShell called Power Forensics, and it's a free module uh, which you can use to analyze that kind of situations, and it allows you to analyze the drive and also extract information from it in a very raw way. There's also TSK Sleuth Kit, which you could use. Uh, PowerShell Forensics, uh, it's a little bit more convenient, I would say, but both, both solutions are absolutely fine. Yeah? So what we're going to do, at the very beginning, we're going to find out what kind of objects are tagged as deleted. So let's do that. And we can see that there is one file that has been deleted. It's called p.exe. Yeah? You can, by the way, recover your drives, even though they've been defragmented, uh, or fragmented, uh, depends on the situation from the drive this way. So what I'm showing you right now, it's a super practical demonstration on if you delete yourself a file and nobody really over re has overwritten it, then you are still able to do it for free this way. Yeah? Uh, okay, so we can see that it has a record number 38. This is very cute because record number, it's like, what does it mean? In, I in Linux, it's called inode. In Windows, by the way, it's also called inode. So this is pretty much the indexing number of the file on the drive. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, et cetera. Yeah? So technically in Windows, we've got tens of thousands of files like that. This is pretty much a small drive. That's why it's so small. Yeah? So we can get and set up the variable fr for the uh, index 38. And we can check out what kind of attributes we've got. And remember, guys, I said at the very beginning that, well, in the middle, that we've got three attributes of the file on the disk. Standard information, name, and data. This is basically data that you can see over here. Let me enlarge this here. Yeah? So here, it says data run, and that identifies us that there is actually a data section of that file that maybe we would like to check out. And you can see also allocated cells and the real size. We know where it comes from. It comes pretty much from the cluster size and the optimization of the files being on a disk. Yeah, so I'm taking that amount of clusters, but eventually file is shorter. So I'm taking half of the last cluster, for example. Yeah, so this is pretty much where it comes from. Yeah? So it's actually very useful uh, to verify if the file has been digitally signed or not. We're getting there. So um, the second thing I will do, I will verify, of course, what is this data about? And I'm going to display, of course, that data run area. And data run area will tell me where the file spreads or how the file spreads. So it starts with an offset 8267 and the cluster length that identifies as how many cluster, clusters this file actually takes. So if I do have a disk in a row way, I'm able to say like, yes, then we've got 8,000 something. Then what's the cluster size? I need to check that. We don't know. Multiply it 130 times, give it to me. Yeah? So this is quite straightforward and simple. So what's the size of a cluster then? Let's find out. So the size of a cluster is bytes per cluster, and we can see 4096. Yeah? So I'm going to multiply that amount by 130 in order to get this full size of a, of a file. But it's not really full size of a file. It's the cluster size. It's not the real size of a file. Okay? So let's keep that in mind. So what we're going to do, we're going to do invoke forensic DD, and that's the moment we are actually saving that file into C analysis test.exe by saying that the offset is this because it is um, the number 8,000, so we have to multiply it by the cluster size. And the block size we are actually saving, it's the 130 multiplied by 4,096. So let's take that file out. Fantastic. So if you are wondering of what is this, let's just get to the C analysis, yeah, because we already, uh, for real, mm, got access to this file. So we've got, this is my analysis folder. So I got like lots of different interesting trash over here. And uh, let's find out what is this. And as you see, there is this test.exe. And uh, this is what? In America, you call it putty. In Europe, we call it putty. Yes, that's a little difference. Uh, <laughs> it's like potato and potato around a couple of other things. <laughs> um, Sabina call, oh, that's my favorite. Uh, Sub ACL. Okay, so we've got this. Uh, so this is Puri, yeah? I just opened it and that basically worked. But the problem with that guy is that it's, it, it has a signature, but not, not here. 
So how am I able to get the file with the signature, actually? Oh, that is very simple. The thing that I have to do is to shorten it, yeah? So I have to shorten the file. So if we check out what the file is about, allocated styles, and we've got a real size, so sh we can shorten it. By the way, executables are so lazy if it's about adding something to them. You've got an executable, you're like, why don't we just add like one more gigabyte of an empty space? No problem. Yes, executables can do that. Uh, and DLL, same story. Yeah, so if you want to hide something, that's a perfect file for doing this. OK, so let's shorten it. So what we're going to do, we're going to use the array for that. So we're going to take this file that exists, put it into array, and then array has a size. And then basically, we're going to shorten it. Yeah, so technically, um, let's find out. Great. And let's get into C analysis. And let's verify, of course, uh, I'm just going to get into the folder. Uh, let's verify, of course, uh, what is this about. Yes, yeah? so we've got a test two that has been just created. We can go to the properties, and as you see, it has a digital signature back. Yeah, so this is how you are able very easily to discover the file. Yeah, now what is cool, and I want to, I want to show you something, something nice right now that is related with the MFT. Yeah. So um, what is quite interesting is that, uh, and this is a lot of fun, um, technically every single time we've got uh, small chunks of data that are actually on the disk, um, the problem with the MFT is that it allows us to put the, put the small chunks up to approximately 700 bytes into its content. Yeah? So the master file table, if you don't format the drive fully, uh, when it's not technically moving, yes, then it's going to still keep the data even though you think like, oh, I formatted this drive 10 times and I used the cipher and I encrypted it. I mean, who cares? If the MFT stayed where it was, then the data is going to be there. Just remember that. Okay, so let's, let's dig in into the subject. And let me show you how at the very end we are able to get this information uh, out. But what I will need to do first, I will need to unmount the drive. And uh, I will need to put it as a, a drive that is uh, readable uh, or writable because uh, I will need to um, technically um, modify it a little bit to show you the context. Uh, so let, let me do that. Okay, so I've detached this. This time the drive will not be read-only. It's going to be like this. So uh, let's do that part. So we should, we should have that drive already and let's see. Okay, fine. So uh, let's do it this way. Um, what I'm going to do, first of all, and let's just get to my script, yes. So I'm going to create on the, on the drive the wipe me files. Yeah, so it's going to be the series of files with the context. Yeah, so let's do that. If we do dear on the X, you've got wipe me, we can open up wipe me and then it's like secure, secure, secure. Yeah, so this is, this is um, yeah, just a file. Okay, so what we're going to do, I'm going to get into that area and I'm going to delete these files, and that's the X drive. So let me just put this one on, X, X, X. Uh, here we go. Fantastic. And I'm going to do with del deletion with the shift. Yeah, that's fine. Shift, delete. Are you sure? Yes, I do. OK, fine. Now let's torture the drive a little bit. We're going to cipher the drive, cipher the drive with wiping it at the same time. Yeah, so um, we're going to technically overwrite that. By the way, in PowerShell, it's funny how it's displayed because first it displays the command and then it displays the remaining dots. <laughs> in the CMD, it's, it's, it's in progress, yes. Anyway, so now we're going to do a little bit of analysis. We're going to find out, this is a pure drive, what is already on the drive while you format it, yes. So we've got here the root of the drive, yes, and also zero. It's nothing but, and let me select it, MFT, so we can just maybe ch change it over here. Here we go, let's see what's that. And as you can see, this is an MFT. So MFT is already there. Can I check what is inside MFT? Yes, always. So we're going to do get forensic file record, and we're going to do zero, copy file, see analysis, xmft.txt. So we're going to copy things out, yeah? So let's do it. And let's technically open up that particular file, I'm curious too, of what we got inside. So we're going to get into C analysis. We've got the CXMFT, and it's a mess, I agree. But that's the beauty of the MFT, that the content of the small files below 700 bytes are there. Don't forget that, yes? If you have like a passwords.txt little file, I mean, just kidding, of course, but I mean, who knows? Or if someone had it during the attack and deleted everything, then check out over there because maybe there's going to be something 
out there waiting for you to be to be discovered. Small thing, but uh, can make us happy one day because maybe there can be some a little bit of more traces uh, of what's going on within the within the operating system. Yeah. So this is the this is the story. Now, um, in summary, what is important to say is, is of course that MFT occupies a certain space on the drive. And unless, of course, you, um, you don't do the full format of the drive, it's where it is. So if you do wipe, override, or whatever, then the MFT is not moving. And that is really the key uh, thing that I wanted to uh, show you today. OK, guys, so this is a little bit of what's going on within the forensics of the operating system. What are the conclusions at the very end? Well, absolutely, make sure that anything that we've mentioned, so prefetch, USN, etc., is enabled. It doesn't hurt, it doesn't impact performance. I mean, we are not living 15 years ago where we are like, oh, does it impact? Of course it doesn't. We have such a great operating systems configurations that uh, really enabling a USN journal, which is a quite a normal thing to enable, it's not uh, painful. A prefetch as one of the options, unless you have a better process tracking uh, possibility, things like Sysmon, it's, as I already mentioned, it's pretty amazing and it's free. Uh, at the same time, working nicely, integrating with Splunk, etc., so uh, with OMS, uh, so, so it's a pretty nice solution. Uh, first of all, we have to always image the data before we play with it. I was already mentioning with it. As you could see, I was doing the first analysis of the drive with the read-only attached drive. This is the practice that we should have because we don't want that to affect our output. Incident response procedure, using the story at the very beginning that I shared with you of our customer, it's something that we need to think about if you don't have it yet. Maybe you have tested it, maybe not. This is something that we see across the whole world that our customers are not really having. And uh, we've got, we are traveling pretty much all over. And at the very end, what is important to know is sometimes hacker can be smarter, sometimes we can be smarter. And the more time you spend, the more you're gonna dig in the question is, of course, how much time do we have? One of our customers, not really long time ago, had a whole domain controller and the whole domain controller is, sorry, uh, compromised. Yes, it's actually an anti-fraud uh, organization on the country level. Uh, imagine, I mean, it's, it's, it's a funny situation. If funny, of course, not funny. Yeah? But, um, but what happened is that um, all the banks in that country report to that customer. Yeah? And their whole domain has been compromised. What would you do? Just a thought. You don't answer, but what would you do if your domain has been compromised? It's a pretty messy situation. We could be like, hmm, depends how, many, how much money and time we've got. Totally, and that is probably something to guide us to the answer, but something to, to think about at the end. And uh, hopefully you like the presentation. Don't forget uh, to dig into the blog. All the tools and the presentation should be already there. Uh, my team is always with me, so it's good to, good to have that. Uh, it's secureacademy.com. Uh, where you can download, of course, all the things. There's lots of free content, um, lots of videos, lots of like ways how to hack things and so on. Uh, so this is a little bit of a, a setup. And uh, if you would like to get a little bit of a challenge, we're always inviting everybody to fill up the quiz. Again, it's free. We are passionate people. 25 questions. There are a couple of thousand people that already answered. Uh, 25 questions average in cybersecurity is 13, which is disgusting. So hopefully after this presentation, uh, you're going to rise the average. Thank you so much.